After Nankai split off from their wartime merger with Kinky Nippon Railways and took the Hawks with them, Kinky Nippon found that they liked the press that the team had given them, so they decided to start one of their own. They saw how much Kinky Great Ring had put eyes on the company and wanted that kind of buzz again, so in 1949, they founded a new team and applied for membership. In 1950, the Kintetsu Pearls were accepted into NPB. The name Pearls came from the thriving pearl industry of Mie Prefecture, which was mostly served by Kinky Nippon Railways. The Pearls were originally supposed to join the Central League, as NPB wanted to balance the four Kansai-based clubs, but the Osaka Tigers refused, and Kintetsu joined the Pacific League, and they would share Osaka Stadium with the Nankai Hawks. The Pearls were terrible, like not even just regular bad, just truly god-awful. In their first four seasons, they finished last. Only two position players even put up three war in that time, 1950 Shigeyoshi Morishita and 1953 Takeshi Suzuki. Pitching-wise, only three. Mitsuro Sawafuji in 1950 and 1953, Fumio Tanaka in 1951 and 1952, and Junso Sakine in 1953. By 1954, things had got better. Noboru Yamashita threw the first no-hitter in team history, and the Pearls finished fourth and won 74 games. It was a distant fourth, but it was progress. Takeshi Suzuki swiped a record 71 bases to win the Stolen Base King Award, which would be the only major award won by anyone who played for the Kintetsu Pearls. After moving into Nippon Life Stadium in 1957, the team was back to its old losing ways, except this time it was turned up to 11. In 1958, they finished with a record of 29, 97, and 4. 49 and a half games back of the pennant winning Nishitetsu Lions. 230 winning percentage. They were 27 and a half games back of fifth. Kazuhisa Inao had more wins as an individual than the Kintetsu Pearls had as a team. So after that, Kintetsu reckoned it was time for change. So Hall of Famer Shigeru Chiba was brought in to manage. He didn't like the name Pearls and insisted the team change it. The name Buffaloes was chosen in reference to Chiba, who was known as either the Bull or the Buffalo during his playing days. However, a Kintetsu executive pointed out that in English, the plural for Buffalo is just Buffalo. So the team became the Kintetsu Buffalo in 1959. This confused a lot of people. Just because a name is proper doesn't mean it flows well. Like, there's a reason they aren't called the Toronto Maple Leaves. So, in 1962, the team lengthened it to Buffaloes, doing so right after Chiba resigned. They explained the name change by saying, we want the whole team to be fierce Buffaloes, not just the manager. The name change didn't do much. Atsushi Kodama and Jack Bloomfield would do their part to make the Buffaloes relevant, but the team still sucked. They finished last so often that they were branded as the Subway team. This did have one benefit though. In the 1965 draft, they were gifted the first pick of the second round and they used it to take Keishi Suzuki. Suzuki would immediately become the ace of the staff and is still the greatest pitcher to ever don the Buffalo's uniform. But it was like adding a $10,000 stereo system to a $500 shitbox. The Buffaloes would continue their losing ways until 1969. Suzuki, coupled with a suddenly elite outfield featuring Masahiro Doi, Toru Ogawa, and Yozo Nagabuchi, formed the first competitive team in Buffalo's history. They finished in the top three for the first time in their 20 year history, coming out of absolutely nowhere. Having finally tasted success, they also found out what anguish feels like. They finished two games back of the Honkyu Braves. Despite being a top three team for the next four years, they never finished within 10 games of the pennant winner. By 1973, they were back in familiar territory, the basement. But in 1975, something amazing happened. They won the pennant, and they did so by eight games. Clarence Jones, Toro Ogawa, and Kyosuke Sasaki were an unstoppable force all year, and Keishi Suzuki would finally have backup in the form of Koji Ota and Yutaka Yanagita. And who would they be playing? Oh, would you look at that! Another first-time pennant winner, the Hiroshima Carp, but they'd snuck in by the skin of their teeth, and this Buffalo's team was ready to take them down. What do you mean there's a playoff series? Yeah, so in the wake of the Black Mist scandal taking a hammer to the PL's popularity, the Pacific League had decided to institute a playoff system to get butts in seats. Because they hadn't won both halves, the Buffaloes would have to play the Honkyu Braves in said playoffs. They lost. And the Braves would end up beating the Carp for their first Japan series. The Buffaloes wouldn't be competitive again until 1978, when they finished second to a Honkyu Braves team that had won both halves. 
but there was a silver lining. Because of the sheer conflicts of interest within Yakult's board, they hadn't offered their star Charlie Manuel the kind of deal he wanted, and the Buffaloes swoop right in. Manuel, better known to his teammates as Uncle Chuck, had the best offensive season in Kentetsu Buffalo's history. He was so good that people were wondering if he might become the first foreign player to hit 50 home runs in a season. That was until Lotte Orion's pitcher Soroku Yagisawa hit him in the face with a fastball that was totally an accident, he swears. Manuel would miss two months with a compound jaw fracture, and this brief stumble meant that the Buffaloes were unable to win the second half and would have to face the Braves in the playoffs. They demolished them. Now it was on to the Japan series. Their opponent? The team they should have faced in 1975, the Hiroshima Carp. The two teams would battle all the way to a Game 7, where it looked like the Buffaloes might win it. Down by one, no outs, bases loaded. That's when you remember that the Carp's closer was Yutaka Inatsu. After he struck out Kiyosuke Sasaki, the Buffaloes attempted a suicide squeeze that Inatsu saw right through. He didn't even give Shigeru Ishiwata anything he could remotely try and get down. Two outs. That play alone reduced the Buffalo's chances of winning by 35%. After that, it was a formality. Ishiwata struck out, and the Buffaloes lost the Japan series on a ninth inning Noble Tiger. After that, the Buffaloes stayed competitive. Mitsu Yasuhiro no would finally hit the first cycle in team history, and the Buffaloes would win the second half. They would once again demolish their playoff opponent, this time the Lotte Orions, with the final score of Game 3 being 13-4. They would once again battle the Hiroshima Carp all the way to Game 7 of the Japan series, but this time it wasn't even close. The Carp won 8-3. After that, Manuel returned to the Swallows, and the Buffaloes went straight back to the basement. After moving out of Nippon Life Stadium and into Fujidera Stadium, the Buffaloes would hang around mid-pack for most of the 80s. Their best hitter during this time was Dick Davis. Dick Davis was indeed one of the best hitters in NPB in the mid-80s. Too bad he thought bringing marijuana to Japan was a good idea. After his arrest and deportation midway through the 1988 season, the Buffaloes caught a break. They landed Ralph Bryant from the Chinichi Dragons in a trade, and he went on to have one of the best power hitting seasons in NPB history. 34 homers in just 74 games. For the first time in a long time, the mighty Cebu Lions had a challenger. The Buffaloes fought and fought all the way to the last games of the season, a doubleheader with the Loteo Ryans. They needed to win both to get the pennant. They tied game one. But this was a season to build on. Bryant would hit 49 homers in 1989, Herman Rivera added 25, and Takahisa Suzuki added 20 on top of that. Meanwhile, Hideyuki Awano and Kazuyoshi Ono had great seasons on the mound. They manhandled the Yamiuri Giants in the first three games of the Japan series. But they forgot the golden rule of sweeping. Keep your foot on the throat. The Giants would finally wake up from their slumber, and reverse swept them. I know what you're thinking, right? Does this mean the Buffaloes go back to the basement? No. By some miracle, the Buffaloes ended up winning the Hideo Nomo sweepstakes in 1989. With Nomo leading the staff, and Bryant leading the offense, the Buffaloes remained a very good team. Small problem, the Lions were better. After Nomo left after the 1994 season, and Bryant after 1995, the Buffaloes fell off a cliff. Sure, they had a shiny new Osaka Dome to call home, and had Norihiro Nakamura, Phil Clark, and Tuffy Rhodes leading the offense, but they had no pitching staff to speak of. They stayed locked in the basement. Until something happened in 2001. They finally got pitching. Katma Ikawa finally realized his potential, however briefly, and Jeremy Powell and Sean Bergman backed him up in their rotation. Meanwhile, Norihiro Nakamura hit 46 home runs. And Rhodes? Well, he hit 55. They clinched the pennant in amazing fashion, a come-from-behind walk-off grand slam from Hirotoshi Kitagawa, a man who had been next to nothing during his time with the Hanshin Tigers. Still, their offense wasn't exactly made up of contact guys, but as long as their opponents didn't have, say, the best defensive catcher in the league's history, they should have no trouble winning the Japan series. 
Oh right, the Swallows had Atsuya Furuta. It's no surprise that most 2001 Japan series retrospectives focus on Furuta's brilliance in outsmarting Rhodes and Nakamura. And not for no reason, the Swallows ended up taking the series in five games. Then it was back to good, but not good enough. Kintetsu, rattled with debt, did a backdoor deal in 2004 to merge the club with the Oryx Blue Wave, and following the season, the Kintetsu Buffaloes were no more. The Buffaloes are a weird team to me. By all rights, they should still exist. In a just world, Rakuten would have bought them and they'd still be around today. Instead, Oryx wears their skin, in their home, and gives them no respect. I try to stay unbiased when I do these team history vids, but I do love this team. Which is weird because I didn't know they existed until 12 years after they ceased to. But there's something about them and their story that's almost inspiring. The Buffaloes and their players went through heartbreak after heartbreak. Stuff that would crush normal people. But they kept coming back, day after day, game after game. Because that was the job. That was what they were there to do. I've since talked to a few Kintetsu Buffaloes fans from when they still existed, and they to a T describe this hollowness, this hole that's been in their lives since the real Buffaloes played their last game in 2004. They were a part of something greater than them, and they went through hell supporting that team. The least orcs can do is give them some respect. Re-retire one, Tuffy is a Hall of Famer, I'm out, peace.